Good evening. A number of guests duly introduced by fellows are attending your meeting, um, and I welcome them in your name. Minutes. Society of Antiquaries of London, ordinary meeting Thursday, 22nd of October, 2020. This meeting took place online only. <clears throat> Dr. Samantha Lucy, Vice President in the chair. The minutes of the previous ordinary meeting of Thursday, 15th of October, 2020 were read and will be signed at Burlington House. The certificates of the following candidates for election were laid before the society and ordered to be suspended in the usual manner. Rodolfo Acevedo Rodriguez, Rosalind Blakesley, Matthew Silence, Frederica Sulas, Robert Hill, Caitlin Green, and David Logan. The following communication was then laid before the society. Manufactured Bodies, the Impact of Industrialization on London Health, by Jelena Bekvalitz, FSA. Thanks for return for this communication before the Vice President closed the meeting. Thank you. I will sign these minutes as a true and complete record when we return to Burlington House, but if anyone has any comments as to their accuracy, um, could they please um, send an email um, to the General Secretary um, and note will be taken of it. Now, the following fellows have been elected by online and postal ballot, which closed at 12 noon today. This follows, of course, the adoption of order number five at the extraordinary general meeting, which um, allowed us um, to temporarily suspend in-person balloting um, during the COVID restrictions. Our new fellows are Cressida Williams, Sarah Painter, Simon Horobin, Robert Harris, Anne Best, Gail Falkingham, Adrian Parker, Samuel Abelman, Rodolfo Acevedo Rodriguez, Rosalind Blakesley, Matthew Silence, Federica Sulas, Robert Hill, Caitlin Green, and David Logan. We now come to the main business of today's meeting, which is to hear uh, a paper, Reliquae Isurianae, the Antiquarian and Contemporary Exploration of Roman Oldbra by Professor Martin Millet and Dr. Rose Ferroby. Professor Millet is Lawrence Professor of Classical Archaeology in the Faculty of Classics at the University of Cambridge. He has worked on Roman projects in the UK, Spain, Portugal and Italy, including developing large-scale survey projects of Roman Republican towns. Excavations and surveys in Yorkshire have included Hayton, Shipton Thorpe, Thwing and Rudston, leading to new understandings of the Iron Age Roman transition in the north of England. Dr. Rose Ferraby is an archaeologist and artist using these different approaches to explore and narrate subsurface worlds. Rose co-directs the Oldbro Roman Town Project in North Yorkshire and beyond the practice spans printmaking um, and illustration, for which she has won the Michael Marx Poetry Illustration Award in 2017. And before I pass over the, the floor or the screen to our speakers, I should say that there will be a question and answer session at the end. If anyone who is joining us virtually would like to ask a question, please type it into the chat function on Zoom or YouTube, and I'll put it to the speakers um, at the end of the lecture. So, uh, Martin and Rose, the, the, the screen is yours.
and just checking that that's come through all right. You can all see the screen. Oh, perfect. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for having us to talk this evening. Um, it's uh, a distinct pleasure to come and talk to the antiquaries um, in part because they've been such big supporters of the project and uh, most recently publishing our book, which has just come out this year. Uh, today's talk is going to span the antiquarian and contemporary exploration of the site, and uh, we hope you enjoy it. So Aldborough is located in the north of England on the road, the Roman road running from York up towards Hadrian's Wall and on the River Ure running down, down the valley. It was the Civitas capital of the Brigantes and uh, an important centre which we're learning more and more about. You can see from this beautiful aerial, aerial photograph by Dominic Powsland that the site now is a small village with agricultural uh, land around it. And if I just run my cursor, you can see the uh, area of the town wall uh, underneath the cursor and that the village is sort of sitting snug within it. And part of the reason that Olber has remained so small was that uh, in the 17th century through to the early 19th century, it was a rotten borough. So it was, the development was constrained. And that's meant that it stayed small and the archeology span is still very visible beneath the surface. And above the surface, we see elements of the topography of the town wall. The streets follow the same lines as the principal streets of the Roman town. And we see things like the church located within the Forum Square. And um, it's, uh, wonderful to be able to see how many things we can pull out of this. And Alborough has a rich history of antiquarian and archaeological research. And part of this is to do with how, how we find different ways of seeing archaeology. And we're really interested in this talk to see how different ways of researching the past, but also presenting and visualising it in different ways. And um, we'll take you in, in turn from the antiquarian work through to the contemporary and how that's being synthesized in new ways and they've been drawn together in different ways. And to start us off, I just wanted to begin in a way by thinking about those different ways of seeing. And um, I wanted to start with a project which I did with Rob St. John last year. And in sound marks, we were interested in uh, exploring the subsurface and the different ways in which we draw together elements of data and mapping and materials and knowledge to reimagine what's underneath the ground. And in a way, this is what archeology span is all about. How do we find these different ways of imagining and keeping curiosity going? And in the little short clips that will follow, you'll see my visual work, which draws on different elements of the research we've been doing, different ways of mapping and seeing data. And Rob's sound work, which draws in different elements of recorded um, sounds on site, sampling, using the magnetics to draw out different sounds and tunes and rhythms, but also focusing really deep in, as we do in archaeology, to those little things that give us answers and um, allow us to think about the world in different ways. So in the little recording that follows, so make sure you've got your sound well turned up, you might hear things like photosynthesizing plants beneath the river and insects stridulating. You might also hear the, the music and breathing that comes from the, the magnetic works that we've done, which Rob has manipulated and sampled. So I'll just put that on now and leave you for a minute just listening before we head on into the rest of the talk.
I hope you enjoyed that and it woke you up at the beginning of, of this talk. And Rob's and my work um, took really eight different sites around the Roman town, which we sort of excavated into and created a walk around for which you can explore the subsurface world. And as you'll hear as we go on, there's another walk which was invented much earlier than Rob's and mine, which was uh, uh, the idea of um, introducing people to the Roman finds. So now we'll get into how, how people have been exploring the discoveries and presentation of these different finds over time. And uh, during Martin's and my work on the town, we've been very interested in pulling together all these different strands of work that's been going on. The different red dots that you can see on here are all the different historical interventions that have taken place at Aldborough since we think sort of within the 1600s through to today. And today we're going to really focus on the antiquarian period and then jump over the 20th century to um, see how that's connecting with our own work uh, more recently, um, just due to not being able to talk about everything, otherwise we'll be here for hours. So, Aldborough has been identified as the Azurian mentioned in the Antonine itinerary since the 16th century, and much of the significant knowledge about the site was re recovered before the development of Roman archaeology. On this estate map of 1708, we see some of these discoveries, including a mosaic, which you can see at point uh, B, where are we? Down here, and the quayside visible here and a Roman bridge here. These discoveries were brought to light by the vicar in Aldborough. The Reverend Richard, uh, Edward Morris was incumbent of the parish from 1676 to 1719. This was a very long period during which he carried out significant research and being a small parish, people must have brought things to him to look at. Morris himself doesn't seem to have published anything at Aldborough, but importantly, he was an avid letter writer and guide Who's interested and encouraging, who was interested and encouraged antiquarians of the day to visit and draw on this knowledge in their own work. One such antiquarian was Francis Drake, who used information from Morris in his Eber Arkham, his History of York. In this volume we see the first known plan of the site, which you can see here, with the principal streets and the town wall, and pointing out Studforth Hill at the top, uh, which was thought to be the amphitheatre. And it also included some of the earliest illustrations of mosaics. Being a prominent antiquarian with a national profile, this brought Olber into greater prominence and we begin to see reference to it in a variety of publications. In 1770, we see the first illustration of an art excavation at Olber, a rare example of archeological recording from this period. This drawing is by Eli Hargrove of the excavations of the North Range of the Forum. It was preserved in an album of his son, William Hargrove, and is similar to the plan presented by Gough in Camden's Britannia, though is much more detailed. Aside from the notes and discoveries, such as a gold coin of Trajan and an urn and a drain, this plan is wonderful in its rendering of both subsurface archeology span and the face on view of buildings. These are so well rendered as to make them still recognizable today. We can identify the farmhouse that still stays standing here, and the ship in the pub, which is which just shows that archaeologists have always tried to excavate as close as possible to the pub. <laughs> the presentation of these discoveries is really what makes Olbra stand out, and perhaps the best example of it is its exam uh, antiquarian garden, which we shall explore now. Before the 1830s, the Duke of Newcastle's ownership of Aldborough had prevented the development uh, with the Rotten Borough, but not encouraged archaeological excavations. In 1832, the estate was purchased by Andrew Lawson, who was actively interested in excavation and the presentation of antiquities. The map we see here was created as part of Eckroyd Smith's publication, Reliquae Zuriani, which summarised all the findings of Andrew Lawson's work and was published in the year of his death. Many of the discoveries and excavations were transformed into an antiquarian garden to show off and display both objects and excavated features in situ along the side of a path that wound along through the design gardens in Pine Eaton. On this map drawn by Mark Hesse and some of the other drawings that we'll see as we go through are also by Hesse for Eckroyd Smith's volume. 
we can see Albury Manor marked in yellow, which is where we begin our walk. And we'll take a tour along the path shown in red, along through past the quarry and finally to the prospect tower at the end. Some other interesting things just quickly to note on this map are the town walls which run around the edge, the amphitheatre at Studforth, and you can see the location of the Forum, the North Range of the Forum, shown just above the church. So we begin at Olber Manor, and visitors coming out of the manor would have um, gone into a specially built uh, museum building, which was put up over the top of this corridor mosaic, an in situ mosaic discovered uh, by Andrew Lawson. Within the museum, visitors would have been able to see different uh, objects found, such as burial urns and domestic pottery, different kinds of uh, parts of mosaics and glasswork, much of which is still on display in the current museum. Leaving the museum and starting up the garden, they would have seen part of an excavated bathhouse on display, which is now uh, being covered over and landscaped, so it's not visible, um, but would have been quite a remarkable sight coming out of that museum. Heading on up the path, visitors would see what's there now, a part of the Roman town wall, which we can see here as this lump uh, still in existence and the path wound its way around it. And you can see on the picture in the bottom left, visitors in the Victorian period walking around an area to the left of our picture, which was part of an excavated townhouse, looking at the different remains. And we also see um, another quite important element of the garden, which was the display of different parts of stonework. Some of these were aspects and pieces that had been found on site, bits of architectural um, columns and masonry, um, which we can see uh, on the bottom right. But other pieces were brought in. Uh, Andrew Lawson was an avid collector and he seemed to have sort of brought in pieces from the locality. And in the middle, we can see uh, this beautiful Anglo-Saxon cross shaft, which was brought in from nearby Kundal. And as we continue up the path, we can see more of this stonework, different inscriptions, but also this beautiful Roman altar, which you can see has had carved into it an inscription, probably during the Victorian period, a sort of fake inscription to heighten that sense of walking through uh, this Roman antiquarian garden. And it's these little pieces like this that make it so special. We see this continued as we get up to the next area of the, of the walk. In front of us, where my cursor is, we can see the town wall again, as that lump there. And to its left, part of the open excavation of a Roman townhouse. And in front, there's a little uh, promontory, a stone line promontory, whereupon uh, different bits of stonework were displayed. The photograph in the bottom left shows different pillars displayed by this in the Victorian period, and we see those as well in Eckroyd Smith's illustration. But since then, different bits of stonework have been added from the excavations in 1924 and those in the 1930s, adding to the sense of that, uh, that walk, and it's really endured through time. And we understand these open excavations much better from Eckroyd Smith's um, publication. The drawings done by Mark Hesse really show quite detailed plans of what's going on. So we see there the city wall that was running up the side and that beautiful um, townhouse with its outsidal rooms, as well as little sketches showing what the remains would have looked like and did look like at the time. As we carry on up, we get to the, the corner of the town wall where the west wall becomes the south wall. And at this point, we get to the um, prospect mound we think this was um, constructed from the spoil from the quarry. And in the Victorian period, it would have been coated in flowers and had a path leading up to the top, from which point you can look down the west wall to where we've just walked and along the south wall of the town through the trees and looking at it towards the prospect tower. And the flowers at the moment are not out, it's the autumn, but you can imagine the spectacle of this, um, of this point and that, uh, wonderful sense of being able to look up and down the town walls and out from that point to the Yorkshire Dales as well. And it also gave a view into the Roman quarry, which is a really magical and quite special place. This quarry was begun in the Roman period to provide stone for the town. This is a point where the red sandstone outcrops quite shallowly. 
and um, many of the buildings in the town are constructed from it. In the Victorian period, we think that parts of it had been uh, quarried some more for other buildings and part walls in the estate, but it was also brought into this um, antiquarian garden walk and the path descends into it, reusing uh, parts of a spiral staircase and um, ending sort of on this promontory looking down. And in that period, these little niches were cut into the stone and statues put into them. We think most likely the statues have come from the um, church in Borough Bridge, which was demolished during Andrew Lawson's lifetime. And they, they may well be downpipes, which have been stood upwards. And they used to be many more, but they've since disappeared. And also the quarry is made more magical by the fact that the tool marks are still evident on the, the stone faces. And the planting has been done as such to make it feel quite um, sort of romantic. It's got the ivy falling over. It would have been full of quite rare ferns and it's been planted with um, all sorts of quite interesting tree species. And it's at this point that we're sort of coming into the main part of the Pine Eaton. And so we come out of the, into the light and look at the trees along the south part of the town wall, which we can see running along to the left. This area of excavated town wall remained open through the Victorian period and stays open today for visitors to see. It was re-excavated in parts and um, mended in the 1960s and 70s by Dorothy Charlesworth. But you can see um, the real sense of walking along next to these things, what, how powerful it was and the um, different kinds of trees that have been planted up. And on those stones themselves, you can see little details like uh, the Roman masonry marks. Um, so there's plenty to look at. If we take a little detour off the main path quickly, we can see the mosaics which were excavated. This is an area which was excavated by Andrew Lawson and formed part of a townhouse with a little domestic bath suite. And two mosaics were found as part of that building, the lion and the star. And these little buildings that have been uh, built on top of them, so they've remained in situ to be looked at, um, date the first one, the brick one, is built very much in the Georgian style with little windows to look in, and the second one out of stone. And they're quite remarkable examples of presenting Roman um, antiquities and mosaics in this way. And at the bottom, we can see Mark Hesse's sketch on the far left from the excavations themselves, the original sketch, and his more detailed drawing for the publication, um, which again shows that lovely continuation of an aesthetic which developed um, through that publication. And re-excavation of that area in 2016 proved just how accurate these recordings were as well. So not only they, do they have an aesthetic, but they were exceedingly accurate for their time. And finally, at the top of the path and the end of the walk, we come to the museum and the prospect tower. Here you can see on the right hand side, the original Victorian museum that was built here. And on the bottom left, you can see what that looked like inside. They reused that corridor mosaic from the first museum and relayed it on the floor and uh, displayed all the finds which had come about from the excavations. And we see visitors such as the Society of Naturalists coming in 1867. And going up to the top of the prospect tower, which stands in front of uh, the stone building and experiencing the final view. And down on the left hand side, um, the little um, dark red building is the current museum as well. So it's a nice continuity of things going on at the site. So if like those Victorian naturalists, we climbed to the top of the prospect tower, we would have looked out across the village and across to the, uh, the Hambleton Hills and the river and here in this beautiful image is the, that's the frontispiece of Eckroyd Smith, we see the antiquarian looking out with his, the tools of his trade and with Eckroyd Smith's map and Reliquae Azuriani, which is quite a lovely way of ending. And in the museum today, the objects really combine together the things that we're finding most recently with those antiquarian finds to really bring a synthesis and new stories to the site. And that's where I'll stop and hand over to Martin for the synthesis. Thank you. Um, what Rose has just explored with us is, uh, in a sense, the golden age of uh, exploration of uh, Roman Albra. Um, following on from the work that 
ended in 1852. Um, there's something of a dark age of uh, archaeological work with comparatively little excavation done. Um, there are two phases of interest in the site in the 1920s, 1930s, and then um, some desultory rescue work done in the 1960s and 70s. Um, we're going to pass over that today, although those of you who are, um, I'm sure, interested in it will be able to look at the details in the book that has just been published by the Antiquaries. Instead, I want to focus this evening in the second part of the lecture on the work that we've done since 2009 at Aldborough. This has combined a geophysical survey with a close analysis of all the past finds, particularly the antiquarian work and the work of the 1920s and 30s, uh, which has enabled us to arrive at something of a new synthesis. I don't want to say very much about the geophysical survey work, which with the help of funding from uh, the Jones Fund is now continuing uh, actively on the site. But um, by combining uh, handheld uh, magnetometry work with uh, now uh, the use of uh, mechanized data collection, we've covered more than 250 hectares of the Roman town, which you can see um, on the left, and the immediate environs of that. In the best preserved areas, uh, the detail that that magnetometry survey produced um, is quite extraordinary. And we're seeing here the northern part of the town, the defences and the layout of the buildings within, where you can see quite extraordinary quality of detail of uh, the Roman remains. But in other areas of the site, uh, the uh, surface coverage, uh, things like the presence of the churchyard and so forth, mean that uh, magnetometry doesn't work so well. And we have therefore uh, worked with uh, colleagues, particularly Levin Verdonk from Ghent University, in collecting data using ground penetrating radar. And in the area that Rose was showing us uh, where the mosaics displayed, you can get a sample of that uh, information on the following animation. What we're seeing here are going down through depths from the surface uh, to reveal the Roman buildings, showing uh, the radar enabling us to see uh, different depths uh, through time. So we're going down uh, about a meter. Now we start seeing the Roman buildings emerging, uh, the details of the Roman buildings, uh, the floors now, the buildings then begin to disappear as foundations and we go into the natural. Um, that work, both the magnetometry and the ground penetrating radar, has enabled us to build um, a quite detailed picture of the Roman town and to map uh, the street systems, the buildings and so forth. Just as one example of this, uh, which is uh, explored in detail in our recent volume, uh, you can see the area around the uh, Roman mosaics. Um, I hope you'll recognize at the top uh, the building that uh, Rose showed us uh, with the mosaics in it. Um, and to the left of that in the main image, uh, you can see the structures that were showing up on the ground penetrating radar, um, that uh, pair of apse buildings that are sort of tantalizingly uh, in the center of the screen. And further over to the left, uh, you can also see uh, the so-called barracks uh, that uh, Rose showed us as we walked up the uh, antiquarian garden path uh, through the site. Now, the second stage of our work that began in 2016 started in this area and has involved um, selective re-excavation of past uh, sites. <clears throat> and our aim here has been to use um, these past areas of disturbance as um, windows into the uh, development of the Roman town, enabling us to uh, look at the accuracy of the records 
um, to provide dating evidence to understand uh, what had been found better and to get us a better overview of the uh, development of the town. And in 2016, as uh, Rose has already indicated, we dug a small trench re-excavating um, the uh, site, one of the sites that Andrew Lawson dug um, in the 1830s. And you can see in the very top right of the screen, um, our trench superimposed on Eckroyd Smith's plan, showing um, the uh, pretty accurate uh, rendition of his uh, recording, um, which encourages us in our belief that uh, the other recording that was done at that time can be relied on. And that enabled us to uh, integrate the results from those 1830s, 1840s excavation with our own geophysical survey uh, and other work. <clears throat> so drawing um, the use of selective re-excavation, um, perhaps our most uh, successful um, attempt at this was in 2017, where in the very, very restricted area that was available on the grass verge beside the road running through the village, we were able to um, look at a series of anomalies found by the ground penetrating radar that appeared to uh, match with that plan of Hargroves that Rose showed us earlier, showing the north range of the forum as excavated in 1770. And indeed, um, our uh, very narrow trench um, confirmed not only that that was the north range of the forum, it also confirmed the accuracy uh, remarkably of that 1770 plan. And at the same time provided us with um, stratigraphic evidence and uh, pottery uh, to give uh, dating to the forum. And combining that with uh, work on ground penetrating radar in the churchyard, this has enabled us uh, to reconstruct uh, not only the plan, but also the chronology of the forum. That illustrates, um, in a sense, what we've been doing in the last uh, four years uh, with a couple of other trenches that we'll come back to later, that again are uh, trying to use earlier excavations to give us windows into the uh, uh, development of the site. And this, together with the survey work and the analysis of uh, past excavations um, allows us to move towards a new synthesis. And I would underline here that this is towards a new synthesis um, as uh, since we completed uh, our uh, first publication, uh, we're already beginning to uh, develop uh, new ideas and gain new evidence from uh, the current work. And I want in the uh, next few minutes to uh, give you a quick overview of the development of Aldborough as we now understand it, um, with uh, a focus first on the very early development of the site and uh, secondly on its uh, late Roman uh, to early medieval transition. And I'm therefore going to skate over um, the middle period of the development of the site relatively quickly. In terms of origin, um, Aldborough amongst the Kivitas capitals of Roman Britain is comparatively unusual for being a site without an obvious uh, Iron Age precursor. And the development of the site seems to have been stimulated uh, by uh, the development of the road network and the military occupation of the region. Uh, that begins with Petilius Serialis' conquest of Brigantia uh, from AD 70 onwards. And associated with that uh, Roman conquest, we have the fort at Rowcliffe, uh, which is um, a matter of a few hundred metres uh, to the west of Aldborough, that was uh, discovered uh, and excavated uh, during the widening of the a1 in the 1990s and published by Mike Bishop. Now that is clearly um, an important auxiliary fort and the current 
reading of the archaeological evidence um, is that it's established around about AD 70, uh, possibly a little bit before, but more likely in uh, the Syrialan phase, and continues in occupation for 10 to 15 years until around about AD 80 to 85. Now, conventional uh, wisdom was that Aldborough itself was preceded by a Roman military fort um, at the time of the conquest. And uh, with the discovery of the Rowcliffe Fort, this was questioned, but people have tended to the view either that there were two forts, one at Rowcliffe, one at Aldborough, uh, in occupation contemporaneously, or that uh, the Rowcliffe Fort was abandoned and succeeded by another fort at Aldborough. Now, our work in the town, if uh, Rose can move to the next slide, um, I think provides a new um, interpretation for the available evidence. The first thing that's clear is that um, the development of Aldborough is taking place from around about AD 70 onwards. Um, it's not entirely clear from the relatively small amounts of excavation available exactly what is happening at that period. And there is some debate about the exact date that things are starting with the coin evidence recently reviewed by Richard Brickstock, um, pointing to a date around about AD 80 in contrast to some of the pottery evidence that perhaps shows things going on a little bit earlier. But what does seem to be uh, evident from our work is that uh, both Rowcliffe and Aldborough in existence at the same time. And it's the road from York uh, coming up uh, through the Ure Valley to the river crossing at Aldborough, at, the, at Rowcliffe, that forms the focus for early activity uh, at Aldborough. But um, what is significant, I think, about this is that there's a very large extent of occupation at Aldborough. It's running to um, in excess of 10 hectares by the 80s AD and extending uh, further back to 20 hectares by the end of the first century AD. And this appears to be too extensive to represent another ford. And we would rather think about this as the development of some sort of trading uh, settlement uh, that uh, is associated with the military. There are many military fines to support that idea, but is arguably created by uh, traders moving in to supply the army and associated with the military action in the north during the Flavian period, rather than being directly military in itself. And that model um, is uh, strongly based on uh, the geographical location of Aldborough, which is not only on this uh, newly established Roman road, but it's also at the head of navigation on the river Ewer a point where the road comes close to the river and therefore um, facilitates uh, the transshipment of material from uh, road uh, to river and vice versa. And that in the early stages of development of the Roman North uh, will arguably, arguably have been important. And in that respect, um, the model we're proposing for the development of Aldborough um, is to some extent similar to uh, the model that has been developed by uh, some of us for London as, um, if you like, an alien urban community or a, a alien nucleated community created by traders coming in, taking advantage of the circumstances uh, created by uh, the Roman military presence and military advance. In the case of Aldborough, um, this is, uh, ties in too with um, early evidence for the development of um, lead and silver production in Nidderdale, um, about 20 kilometres to the west of Aldborough. Um, epigraphic evidence, and you see the Hayshaw Moore um, 
uh, lead pig here, uh, giving a date of AD 81, shows that very soon after Roman annexation of uh, the North, um, silver and lead production was taking place here. And uh, there is very strong evidence um, that Aldborough was the point that uh, this uh, lead and silver was extracted and taken uh, down river uh, to uh, the sea and to York and beyond. And that um, resonates with the importance of Borough Bridge and Aldborough in later periods for the exploitation of these uh, lead uh, resources. And that gives an added reason for seeing um, the development of, if you like, uh, an economic um, entrepot uh, at Aldborough in the first century AD. That um, rather disorganized settlement, as far as we could see, is transformed sometime in the earlier second century, arguably um, around about AD 120. <clears throat> there are three elements to the development of the town that seem to be uh, contemporaneous at this period. We've already seen uh, from the 1770 plan and our re-excavation, that the forum was constructed in stone sometime uh, around AD 120. That seems to tie in with the laying out of the street grid, um, and given that the street grid uh, is uh, centered on the entrance to the forum at the north side, uh, running along the already existing road, and the town is laid out from that center point, um, suggests that the town planning is going alongside the uh, layout of the forum and its construction. And furthermore, that ties in with the construction of the new road uh, northwards from the forum entrance out through the north gate um, that crosses the river um, just to the north of the town and uh, joins the Deer Street flowing northwards to Hadrian's Wall. And this um, new route of the road to the north, instead of going via a ford at Rowcliffe, um, is integral with the development of the town plan and therefore we think uh, contemporaneous with it. And in the southern part of the town, um, which lies on uh, quite a steep slope, as you will have appreciated from um, the Eckroyd Smith frontispiece looking over the town. Um, this part of the town seems to have been terraced to create not only the platform for the forum, but a series of platforms for the construction of housing in the southern part of the town. Although we don't know for certain, the amphitheatre, uh, which lies uh, just to the uh, south of the town, um, also seems likely to belong to this phase of development sometime in the earlier second century AD. The next stage of the development of the town uh, involves the uh, construction of a town wall and the extension of the street grid. You see the fine uh, view of the town wall from excavations in the 1930s. Um, there has been a lot of debate about the dating of the town wall. Um, our reading of the evidence suggests that this um, is built sometime between about 150 and 180, um, appreciably earlier than some of the other town walls in Roman Britain, and considerably earlier than uh, one or two other commentators have suggested. But the evidence for this, I think, is, is persuasive and uh, suggests that uh, by the later second century, um, Aldborough's Kivitas capital had really uh, taken off in importance and was uh, using uh, wall construction and so forth to express this status. Next, please. I'm rushing rapidly on through the uh, middle period of the development of the Roman Aldborough. Um, we see that once established, um, the urban centre becomes surrounded by um, a massive amount of other development and growth. Um, 
towards York, uh, to the south and east of the town, um, the development along the road seems largely to be dominated by a funerary landscape with evidence of quite large mausolea, as well as open cemeteries flanking the road as you approach from the south. But as you leave the town going north towards the river, uh, the uh, flanking structures seem to be largely commercial and involve industrial development and so forth, um, a sort of large uh, conurbation uh, flanking the road as you uh, head out north. Whereas to the uh, south and east of the town, um, there is evidence for um, further industrial buildings and so forth, but also quite a lot of things that are probably stock enclosures, um, uh, agricultural features and so forth. So um, Albury is not simply uh, that um, urban nucleus, it is um, a whole uh, developing landscape uh, covering 100, 150 hectares of development around the town. And uh, at some stage in the uh, this development, um, we see uh, both the elaboration of the town defences, which are added to with uh, a series of external towers and um, large scale uh, additional ditches, uh, probably dating to the mid fourth century. And um, sort of interleaved with those showing different phasing uh, uh, occurrence from a slightly earlier date, uh, we have um, two ditched annexes, one uh, around the east gate and one around the north gate, uh, which we're interpreting as um, sort of enclosures for uh, securing uh, cargoes and so forth uh, that are parked there um, on the edges of the town as part of the commercial development of the site. But the uh, striking development of the uh, defences is something we will come back to in the later period. Uh, before we do that, it's worth emphasising that the commercial role of the town um, is something uh, that doesn't die out in the first century, but seems to continue uh, throughout the uh, Middle Roman period. And in particular, um, uh, excavations in the 1920s um, picked up part of a large building that Rose will point out on the uh, slide, um, which runs for about 60 metres uh, north-south, just on the northern edge of the grid within the town wall. Um, that building is one that we um, partially re-excavated in 2018 establishing that it dates to the latter part of the third century and is apparently um, a large aureum. This seems to tie in with a series of others in that uh, northern part of the Roman town and may be associated with a couple of um, lead ceilings uh, which come from the area just immediately to the north, one of which um, is associated with the military, um, representing um, a beneficiarius consul, uh, consularis, um, and another uh, representing uh, the province of uh, Britannia Inferior, suggesting that um, the development of these trading uh, features uh, may well be associated with development of taxation in kind and military supply um, through uh, the third and into the uh, fourth centuries AD. So suggesting that alongside its um, military um, supply function and its uh, civic governance function, we have this large scale uh, provision of storage um, and commerce uh, being part of the raison d'etre for the town, and that making it uh, somewhat different from some of the Kivitas capitals we see elsewhere in Britain. And that brings us then to the late antique phase, which um, is uh, sort of tantalizingly difficult to understand, as with so many other sites. 
in Britain. What is clear is that the latest phase of the defences, uh, which uh, Rose will point out now, it includes um, a large, very large ditch uh, built round the outside of the uh, mid fourth century defences, which significantly cut off uh, part of the amphitheatre. Um, those uh, ditches seem to tie in with um, something we found in the 2018 excavation, which was a radical um, raising of the bank behind the town wall in the north of the town, uh, which suggests that the defences were being um, very greatly strengthened at some date um, after the uh, later fourth century, arguably perhaps going into the fifth. At the same time as this, or a little bit later, um, a curious cutting is made through the uh, wall um, in the eastern part of the town, creating a new road that leads out into the defensive annex. And um, this, again, must date to some time at the very late fourth, um, fifth century beyond. There are then odd bits of evidence that suggest um, the continuing importance of uh, Aldborough into the uh, early medieval period. Um, the possibility that it's the site that is uh, besieged by Cadwalla in 8, 633 to 635, very uncertain. The fact that the church is built within the Forum Square um, the dedication of the church is late Saxon, although the present structure um, is 300 years or so later. And uh, the fact that both the uh, streets, as Rose indicated at an earlier stage in the lecture, and the ridge and furrow cultivation uh, respect elements of the Roman uh, town layout, suggest that those were relict features in the landscape, if not active features in the landscape, um, into the period of the 8th, 9th, 10th century onwards. That's where our story of Aldborough ended when we completed uh, work on the uh, book that's just been published. But two new, more new pieces of evidence have come to light on the late antique period um, in our most recent work. Um, firstly, uh, our final piece of uh, re-excavation in 2019, unfortunately not uh, yet completed as had been planned in uh, the summer because of COVID, um, has shown that in the a uh, very northern part of the town, uh, there are a series of uh, very late timber structures associated with um, middens rich in animal bone and worked antler um, that we can, um, can see running into the late antique period uh, with radiocarbon dates now uh, for the very late uh, fourth to early fifth century associated with those. Um, and you can see uh, superimposed on the uh, photo of the plan of the 2000, parts of the 2019 excavation there, the foundations of those timber buildings. And uh, above that, um, cobbled surfaces associated with those. Um, interestingly, these buildings uh, using and elaborating um, their uh, structures through the use of quern stones as uh, post pads. <clears throat> We're um, intending to go back to explore more of those buildings and get a better fix on the chronology uh, when uh, COVID allows. And the other piece of work that is hot off the press is that immediately adjacent to the town, um, up in the uh, valley of the Ewer, about 200 metres from the town defences, where we have been doing uh, with uh, Charlie French from the archaeology department in Cambridge, a study of the uh, buried floodplain of the river. Um, uh, Charlie has uh, located um, a relic stream channel and we have obtained a four and a half metre pollen core 
from that, which um, Rob Scaife of Southampton has just completed an analysis of. Um, this pollen core um, gives a, an environmental sequence um, that on the radiocarbon dates that arrived uh, the week before last um, can be dated from starting from about 4,500 Cal BC to uh, finish around AD 800 to 1000 AD. So it's giving um, an environmental sequence that runs with the development of the town. Um, and in that pollen core, you can see um, a number of features, one of which um, is a very marked um, charcoal peak that probably relates to um, the uh, metalworking activity that we also found in our 2019 excavation dating to the second century AD. But most significantly in terms of our understanding of um, the late Roman and post-Roman sequence here, it's clear that this remains um, an agricultural open landscape uh, through the uh, late Roman uh, and medieval period uh, down to the ending of the uh, pollen deposition here around AD 800 to 1000. And that uh, for me offers um, very important new uh, insights into the potential that um, Oldborough, as well as being an exceedingly well-preserved and interesting Roman town, uh, may have um, a lot more to tell us about the late Roman to early medieval transition in this part of uh, the north of England, which has been comparatively difficult to understand uh, up until now. So with that um, sort of tantalizing glance into future uh, research, um, I'll uh, we'll finish and uh, hand back to uh, the president. Sorry, I, I haven't got to ah, start my video. Yes, right, I'm back. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that um, was a, a most interesting um, canter through the um, obviously detailed research on the uh, Oldborough and, and a, a multi-sensory presentation and interpretation of the archaeology below ground, which um, I certainly appreciated, which I think um, uh, is a first for our lectures. Um, now, have I got any questions from people? Um, it's not coming up on the, the chat function. Um, so perhaps I, I can ask one. Um, to kick this off, um, the the replanning of AD one twenty clearly someone with authority over the whole hold of the settlement, the sprawling settlement that, that preceded it. What does this mean, do you think, for the status of the town and the actors involved? Um. <laughs> one, one's not going to mention any particular emperors here, I think. Uh, uh, the, I think one of the big questions uh, in terms of how we interpret not only Aldborough, but also other Roman towns and when they develop, is uh, whether the establishment of um, local government in the sense of the site becoming a Kibitas capital is... Um, contemporaneous with the development of the plan, or whether there was um, a community established there 20 or 30 years beforehand, and the planning then becomes a part of a, a developing what they've already got. My 
um, own inclination is to see this as, as um, a process which is, uh, you get a, I think an alien community coming in, probably power is passed to that as the Kivitas um, before uh, the end of the first century AD. And then um, there's an impetus for change uh, in the Hadrianic period. Um, the mechanism for which I think is probably quite complicated and uh, <laughs> interesting to debate. Thank you. Now questions are beginning to appear. Um, if I can only get, ah, yes, I've got them up on the screen now. Um, from Andrew Selkirk, um, was there a military compound in the second century? Um, no evidence for that in the second century. Um, if those annexes are military and we don't know that they are, um, and I suspect they're more to do with civil power, um, they seem to date to uh, the th third, fourth, rather than uh, any earlier than that. Thank you. I, they do bear a certain resemblance to medieval barbicans, strengthening the gate. Uh, In, gates. Indeed. And uh, uh, it's interesting, I think, in a general sense, um, that there's, there's something similar that John Crichton's identified at Silchester. But generally speaking, because we haven't got this sort of geophysical evidence and survey evidence from outside Roman, other Roman cities, it's very difficult to know whether this is unique to the north, unique to Aldborough, or whether it's something we simply haven't seen. Thank you. Extensive geophys has absolutely transformed our uh, understanding, our picture of, of major settlements. Um, now, uh, Justine Bailey, you talked of evidence for metalworking from your 2019 excavations. Was this iron working or the working of non-ferrous metals? Um, the predominant evidence is for iron working on really quite a large scale and interestingly, apparently uh, using coal as the fuel. Um, but we haven't finished the analytical work on that. Um, there is clear evidence of lead being worked. And um, until we've done the analytical work on the slags and so forth, um, I wouldn't rule out there being other types of metal working. Thank you. Um, now, Francis O'Gorman. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm writing from York, 17 miles away. Do we know anything about Olbra's relationship to York? Well, um, Yes, I think the short version is um, Aldborough is the administrative capital for the territory of the Brigantes, which, as you'll know, represents most of northern England. Um, York is clearly uh, the, both the military centre with the legionary base there, um, and uh, at a later stage from the third century, the provincial capital. So they are, um, in a sense, complementary. Um, uh, without offending anyone in York, um, I would point out that the, the evidence for large-scale um, elite housing in Aldborough is much greater than in York. Um, so it may well be that we've got a sort of um, two sites that are rather more um, like equal in economic uh, pull uh, than people have tended to uh, see in the past. Thank you. Um, from Amanda Claridge, what makes you think the horeum is a horeum? <laughs> um, I can debate that with you, Amanda, and I'm happy to be corrected, but uh, we're thinking of it in terms of its plan and its parallels with um, various other uh, things that have been called Araya, uh, both um, on the wall at uh, Halstead um, and uh, also in the uh, Danube provinces. It's basically the, the outline, the plan of the building and its scale. Yeah. And the absence of internal subdivision. Exactly, yeah. Thank you. Um, from 
Martin Jones, how spatially extensive are the later Holocene sediments within the Ur Valley and what might they be obscuring, e.g. pre-Roman activity close to the river? Um, Good question, Martin. Um, we, we had a happy period in September um, uh, exploring that. And I think the answer is the deposits are more extensive, ra ex surprisingly rather more extensive than we had thought um, with some quite great depths of the deposit. Um, and it looks as though there is going to be um, a complete buried landscape in the 100 meters or so uh, up to the river. Um, and that's why we've got that wonderful uh, pollen sequence surviving. Thank you. Um, now, uh, Andrew Burnett. Um, Drake mentioned coins of Claudius and even Augustus. Anything as early as that? Um, there, uh, I'd need to go and check Richard Brickstock's paper in the last uh, Yorkshire Archaeological Journal. Um, the, uh, I think there are a couple of Claudian ones. Um, I'm not aware of uh, any Augustan ones. And the overall pattern of the coinage, as Richard argues it, um, is entirely consistent with coin use arriving starting in the Flavian period. So where you've got older coins, uh, they are, as with other assemblages from Britain, uh, bringing uh, earlier material in circulation. And from John Lewis, um, the walls do, ah, there's John. You want to ask, ask the question yourself, unmute yourself. Well, I was just going to say, Martin, excellent lecture, uh, uh, and Rose, excellent. The antiquarian stuff was absolutely brilliant. The thought of Victorian antiquaries to the park is just uh, fantastic. Um, going back to the Roman period, you know, I'm a prehistorian, so I'm not really up with all this stuff, but um, the walls do seem uh, quite early. And I was wondering if there are other examples of similar early civic defensive walls. Um, and also, if the Alba defences are not just a matter of civic pride, is there a military threat in that period that they could be responding to that's peculiar to that area, given that you've got presumably a Roman fortress just up the road? Um, that uh, gets into the uh, central historiography of Roman Britain, um, <laughs> in the sense that uh, people have tended to relate civic defences to military threats and uh, you can um, pan through the uh, fragments of Roman literature and uh, take your pick on whether there is a threat there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I, I think the answer for me about them being civic rather than a response to a military uh, threat is that if you approach Aldborough either from the south or from up the road from York, the defences aren't visible until you're almost on top of them. And uh, both from the point of view of uh, defensive uh, value um, and from the point of view of uh, any sensible military strategy, if you were building a wall to defend the town, you wouldn't have built it where you built it. Uh, and I, my own view on that is that they were probably doing something that was architecturally quite fun, which was um, putting a wall up that showed your civic status, but putting it in such a place that it only suddenly came into view as part of a sort of theatricality of Roman architectural display um, at a very late stage. Thanks. Um, one, two more to finish, I think. David Baumgartner, um, can you expand on any more detail about the amphitheatre, particularly the postulated reuse as a fortified nucleus? Um, we don't know very much about the amphitheatre, David. Um, indeed, 
it was only Rose's geophysics uh, um, in 2013 that confirmed that it was an amphitheatre. There had been a dispute about that going back to um, R.G. Collingwood. Um, uh, the suggested reuse is based on the fact that um, uh, when it wasn't thought to be an amphitheatre, various people pointed out that it was probably a Norman ring work. And if you look at the uh, layout of the uh, road as it now runs from York up to Borough Bridge, which is the river crossing in the medieval period, um, the amphitheatre controls that road. And there are a couple of uh, medieval sources that talk about um, a castle at Aldborough and what we're doing is putting two and two together saying that that is probably the castle that Stephen Morehouse is entirely correct it was a Norman ring work but it was a Norman ring work that was uh, remodeling uh, an amphitheater and that that ties in with the uh, the later medieval uh, topographic development rather neatly. Has there been any excavation of it that uh, would link it to a, a Norman date in the remodelling? No, the only piece of excavation um, is recorded in a footnote by in um, JNL Myers's report on the work in the 1930s um, that says, uh, I paraphrase, uh, we dug a trench, this is natural, it's not an amphitheatre. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to return to Rose. I wonder if you could tell us a little more about the creative process that, that turns the archaeology. I think I into, into pictures I could see, but how, how do you imagine the sounds? What's the process by which the sounds uh, are, are added, devised? Oh. <laughs> well, thanks for asking, Paul. Um, the project was a really interesting one in terms of uh, the coming together of Rob and I, in, in a way, because uh, Rob works a lot with sound and me more with image. But the two of us are always interested in looking at things at different scales, and in particular, looking at things that are invisible or hard to see or, or looking very closely at things. And... Um, uh, in the early days, I took Rob round for a walk and I was telling him about all the things that were under the ground and uh, different aspects, such as when we're digging, how we feel our way through the soil or how we listen to what the tool, noise the tools are making in order to sense our way through what we're uh, excavating and trying to understand. And um, as sort of time went on and we bounced things back and forth, Rob developed the sound work um, based on various aspects. So he did things like take... Uh, the interpretation drawings of the uh, magnetic surveys, which you saw throughout the talk, the blue and pink mm -hmm. images. And he uh, put uh, scores across those and created musical scores based on the interpretation and set those to the kind of sounds or instruments that might have existed in the Roman period. He did things like uh, sampling, so taking tiny little samples of sound out from other sounds, which is very uh, reminiscent of you know, what Charlie does when he comes to our trenches and takes a little core out the side of the trench, and then how that expands out into something bigger. And things like we, we spent a happy afternoon putting microphones down one of Charlie's boreholes, the one in fact that went down six metres into that paleo channel that Martin was talking about, um, and finding all the ways that we could hear the sound within that empty space and and it created some very strange sounds I have to say but um, through that process it was a way of um, both thinking about how we uh, sense things as archaeologists and the different ways that we put knowledge together but also spending time listening in the field in a quite a different way because of recording was really really interesting and things like how sound travels through different materials so the sound of contact mics attached to a really creaky metal gate on the floodplain that created a sort of strange ominous booming out into the floodplain or uh, contact mics attached to a Himalayan balsam in the quarry and the sound of rain plopping down the, the stem and things. So it was taking things on all kinds of scales and in many ways that's what I did with the visual work as well uh, was taking aspects of plans and sections and data and things that I've absorbed over the entirety of working on the project, but also a lifetime of living 
uh, on the site. So these things all come together and uh, into a sort of strange imaginary world, which hopefully gives people a chance to um, have a sense of wonder about archaeology and realise that there's never just one story or one voice, but there's a whole existence under the ground that you can merrily spend time with and uh, tell stories about. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Rose, sorry, can I just say, Rose, um, uh, it's worth saying that that Soundscapes is available online, isn't it? Yeah, so the whole, the website is um, soundmarks.co.uk and from there you can download all the sound of Rob's soundtrack. Um, you can see the map with the walk, you can see all the artworks and listen to the different um, uh, sound works at each point with a little narrative. Uh, there's also a book available to buy as well. Thank you. Um, if there are no more questions, um, I just uh, announce the uh, next meeting. I give notice that the next meeting will be on Thursday, the 5th of November 2020, when we will hear a paper, London Bridge and its Houses, circa 1209 to 1761 by Dorian Gerhold, FSA. The meeting stands adjourned. I only wish I could invite you for a drink as we do, <laughs> do in normal times, but thank you all. <laughs>